Hello, my fellow Bereans. Today, we're going to look at the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful story. And as we look at it, we're going to see this concept of the kinsman redeemer. There are things about this that even three years ago, I had no idea. And so I'm really excited to share this with you in case it's new to you as well. So what we're going to do in this study is look at an overview of the whole book and some of the big pictures, and then we're gonna see how it teaches us this concept of kinsman redeemer and how that's gonna mirror the story of Christ as our kinsman redeemer. So in this, I wanted some background information, so I created this insert, and this is just a pretty picture that I found online that I stuck at the top here. I just liked the look of it. And here is the family tree for the book, and it shows how Judah came down to Boaz and then Ruth and how it led to Jesus. And then I also found this other one. And I like this one because it shows the Bible verses where we can see that Ruth came from the line of Lot. Lot's descendant was Moab. And we read about that in Genesis 19 verses 33 through 37. She came through that line. And then we have Boaz, how it leads to King David. So I wanted this on this side. And then on the back side of the inserts, I wanted some maps. And it's nice because I have the book of Judges here. So this map will help me with Judges or with Ruth. It shows the area where Moab is how they had traveled from Bethlehem into Moab and then back. So this is kind of zoomed in on this area and this is a look at it and then some more maps. I like maps seeing where things happen. So here on this first page, I have a note about the fact that this mirrors the story of Christ as our kinsman redeemer. I'm gonna be using this code with a K and an R. The K is in purple because Christ is our kinsman. He's one of us. So purple is the color for believers. So I do the K with the purple, the R with the red, and then I have it colored in in purple and then underlined in red and boxed in in purple just to make it stand out. And then I have here a note that says C inserts last page. So I wanna take a look at some other places in the Bible where we see this concept and it's gonna help us flesh out what we're reading. So this is Leviticus 25 verses 47 through 55. And it says, And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again, one of his brethren may redeem him. Either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. And it says, he shall give him the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. So now I really want to look and see what all this means. So in this, we see two places where we see this concept of redeem, but one of them is 1353, and that is this word gula. It's the kindred redemption, the right of redemption, the price of redemption. It's the redemption price, in other words. And then these ones that are boxed in purple and then underlined with the red and colored in in purple, those are these concepts of kinsman redeemer in verse 48 and 49. And so over here, I have that it's h one. 350 and it's this word to redeem act as a kinsman redeemer do the part of a kinsman what we see in this is they must be related to those they redeem they must be willing to redeem and they must be able to redeem and then i have a note on here to see the insert that i put into page 484 and i'll be showing that to you and that it's in the book of ruth and that christ is our kinsman redeemer and so this was set up in the levitical law that people could be redeemed and we're going to see how god ultimately is our kinsman redeemer you're often going to see these two words together because h1353 is the past participle for 1350. But let's keep going. And so this again is Leviticus, and we just went backwards a little bit. Verse 23, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. Verse 24, and in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possessions, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years. So in this, we see this concept of redemption where I have the purple and red, those are those same 1350 words. So we're seeing that 
This kinsman redeemer includes the land and it includes the people. Up here we have the word a redemption and that's that 1353 word that we talked about. And so again, I have a note to myself of where to go about that insert, but I want to take you to another spot in the Bible. So here we're in Isaiah 54 in verse 4. Five, it says, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So here, and thy Redeemer, that's that H1350 word. So here he's saying that he is going to act as a kinsman Redeemer. He claims himself as our husband. And notice it's talking about the people and also the land. In that same chapter, we see in verse 8, Eight. It says, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. So again, that kinsman Redeemer concept. Here in Exodus 6, verse 6, we see, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you. That whole concept is kinsman Redeemer with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So here we see this concept of kinsman redeemer. So I've notated the word that H1350 to do the part of or to act as the kinsman redeemer and then where to find my insert in the book of Ruth. So here on this first page, I have the book of Ruth and I wanna remember that she's the great grandmother of King David. And then on this, this is a sticky note that I wanted here. And it was just because it was a lot of information, it felt easier to write it on a sticky note and then stick it onto my Bible. So the book of Ruth is traditionally read on the second day of Shavuot or Pentecost. So this was Leviticus 23 verses 15 through 22 is where you can read about Pentecost. The most popular reasons given that this is read at that time is that the setting of Ruth is during harvest time and Shavuot or Passover happens at the spring harvest time. And another reason is that Ruth's acceptance into the Jewish faith was similar to the acceptance of the Jewish people of God's Torah. So those were the reasons given on a Jewish website. And then I think through this study, you're going to see how that there is a deeper meaning to the book of Ruth, how it shows how Christ is not only the kinsman redeemer for the Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles. So we're going to take a look at that. And so now I'm going to assume that you've read this before, that you're familiar with it, and maybe that you find out that we're doing this study on Ruth, and so you go ahead and read it and then come back for this study. So that's the assumption I'm going to make, so I'm not reading everything. I'm just showing you what I have for notes. And then you'll have to let me know in the comments if that works for you, if you have a preference for something different. But this is the way I'm going to do it just to save time. So just as an aside on my Bible, I want to kind of have any information about the book on this side and any historical information on this side. One thing you find out about the book of Ruth is that people are unsure who wrote it. I kind of wonder because of all the chiasms if David wrote the book of Ruth, but you'll read people saying different things. They also don't know when this book happened. So because of that, I haven't put a timeline here or an author. I just have my thoughts on that. So here in this first section, we have these people mentioned, Elimelech, Malon, Chilion, and Naomi. And I've learned a lot of times those can have deeper meanings for the stories. So I always look those up and I find what they mean in the Hebrews. So I have the numbers here, Elimelech and his number, and then it means my God is king. The name Naomi means my delight. Malon means sick, and Chilion means pining. And really the only thing we know about this family is that there was some type of famine happening. So they left Israel and they traveled to Moab. And so it might be they named their sons after the condition of the world, that it was sick and pining. And it might be that their sons were sickly. Maybe Naomi wasn't having enough nutrition, so their names were kind of sad names. And then we see that those two sons take wives, Orpah and Ruth. So Orpah's name means 
means gazelle and Ruth's name means friendship. And one thing that I do in my Bible is anytime I see an ancestor of Christ, I mark it a special way and that's with an underlined in red and circled with yellow. So Ruth is one of those, so I have her marked that way just so as I'm reading my Bible in the future, I'll see it and notice it. And then in Ruth chapter one, verse five, we have Malon and Chilion died also both of them. So she's lost her husband in verse three, and the woman was left or without her two sons and her husband. So this connects with the kinsman redeemer because this is the state that all of us are in. Without Jesus, we have no hope. And in Revelation chapter five, verses three and four, you see a people that are crying because there is no hope for them. She has no hope because she has no husband and no sons. And one thing I wanted to notate for myself in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses five through 10, a childless widow marries the husband's brother to carry on the name. So that's normally what happens. But we can see in verse 12 of this chapter that Naomi tells her daughter-in-laws, go your way for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons. So just as a note, I have that she's too old to marry her husband's brother and have more children to carry on the line. So she really has no hope. But she says, even if I had a husband tonight and should bear sons, she says, would you tarry for them till they are grown? So she's just mentioning the hopelessness of her situation and that they should turn back. They wept and here Ruth held on to her. And then Naomi in verse 15 says, Behold thy sister-in-law, because Orpah kissed her and left. Behold thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. That really hit me that part that she's returned to her gods. So this turning away was turning from the one true God. And then in verse 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not, or don't entreat me to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So Ruth is a Gentile woman the same way most of us are. She has a Hebrew mother-in-law, so she is representing the New Testament church. She's representing all of us. And the way that we become part of God's people is to say, Thy God will be my God. So her hope is the same as our hope. And we'll take a look at Isaiah 56 verses 6 through 7. And I didn't want to forget this, so I noted it here. So I haven't started marking in this Bible, but I'll just show you the sons of the strangers. So in the beginning of the chapter, it's a beautiful chapter. It would be wonderful to go back and read it if you haven't read it recently. We are the sons of the strangers that join ourselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from pollution it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them, so all of us, will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all my people. So when we look at this, we can think, uh, this was Old Testament and this has nothing to do with me. But remember that the Hebrew people were always to be a light to the whole world. And when Jesus came, he showed them who God was and he clarified the law for them. And it says that he would magnify the law and make it honorable. So he taught them to understand the true meanings of things. And the thing that he said when he left, that the disciples should witness to Jerusalem and to go out further and further into the ends of the earth. And so what happened is that Gentiles were brought in to the Hebrew nation. And this is the true worshipers of God. And so again, I just think that's so easy for us to forget and to separate and to think there's an Old Testament God and a New Testament God. But the thing we want to remember is that we're one people. There's no difference between Jew and Greek. We're one people. So within this we have Jewish blood, we have Gentile blood, we're all mixing together, we formed one people. We have just joined ourselves onto them. There was always one church, one message, one belief system, and everyone needs to come back and to become one group of believers who in Revelation it says will keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus.
And like Ruth, we can join on to him. He tells us in these verses how we become one people. We can choose to join on to him in our own way and say, well, this is what I think God really meant. But is that doing it the way God wanted us to do it? So we can look at Isaiah 56 and say, how does God say that I join in with his people? And remember that God says, I am the same. I change not. So I find these verses really chapter 56, verse 1 through 8, just a very important section for all of us Gentiles who have come on and latched ourselves onto God, what it means to be a follower of God. What does he ask us to be? So I think that's a beautiful promise. She's saying, thy God will be my God. So she's accepting for herself God as her own God. So that is our hope. Then in verse 18, it says, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking with her. And that steadfastly minded means to be determined. And there's a story in Exodus 33, 15. And there's a whole series of notes that I have on that about how Moses did that same thing. So I have that marked in brown. I don't have it marked up and it would be too much to go into right now. So just know that's why I have that there. And pretty much if you notice, I'm trying to catch any time I see Ruth's name, I'm marking it with that red underline and the yellow box. So now in chapter two, we meet Boaz and he's in the line of Jesus. So I've marked him the same way. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And for some reason in the past, it's always tripped me up. Who's Elimelech? And I had to remember, oh, that's Naomi's husband. So I did a little brown arrow and underline that with brown to remind myself that's Naomi's husband. So this Boaz is related and he's also a mighty man of wealth, which means he's able to pay. That's a characteristic of a kinsman redeemer. They need to be related and they need to be able to pay the purchase price. And then this is a name Boaz. So I have on here his number H162 and that word means fleetness. And one commentator said that that word means in him is strength. And I couldn't find that in a Strong's, but I liked the sound of that. So I put that down. And I also found out that Boaz is the name of the left of the two brazen pillars at the entrance of Solomon's temple. You find that out in 1 Kings 7 verse 21. So I notated that for myself. And then in verse 2, we see that Ruth says that she's going to go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And Naomi said unto her, go my daughter. And so I wanted to notate the fact that in Leviticus 23 verse 22, it says at the time of harvest, you need to leave some for the poor. So this is hoping that she finds somebody that's going to follow that law that God has set up for them. And then in verse 3, it says that Ruth went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And because I don't speak King James English, I underlined that in green, her hap was to light on. And KJV, it says, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. And this word kindred is 4940, and it just means was of the family of Elimelech. And again, I have Boaz marked as an ancestor of Jesus. So at this part in the study, I just want to zoom out on what's happening so something I learned recently is that there are chiasms found in the book of Ruth. And so I found somebody else's work on this chiasm for chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four. And so what I'll do is I'll zoom in closely to one of these. So I'll show you the chiasm for chapter two. So we have Boaz is kinsman of Elimelech. And the end of this chiasm is in chapter two, verse 20. And it says, he is our kinsman. And then chapter two, verse two, it says, after him in whose sight I find favor. And then right before the end of it, it says, the Lord's kindness to the living and dead. Ruth two, verse three, a field of Boaz. And then chapter two, verse 19, the second half of that verse, it says, man you worked with today is Boaz. And then verse four, from Bethlehem, the house of bread. And chapter 2, verse 18, gave bread to Naomi. Then chapter 2, verse 7, it says, from the morning, the gleaning. And then chapter 2, verse 17, till evening and the gleaning. The next one we find in chapter 2, verse 8, do not glean in another field. And then chapter 2, verse 15, glean among the sheaves. And so we're going closer and closer to the center. Chapter 2, verse 9, drink with the young men. And then chapter 2, verse 14, eat with the reapers. Chapter 2, verse 10, a foreigner. Chapter 2, verse 13, be not like your maidservants. Chapter 2, verse 11, favored her mother-in-law. And then the mirror of that is chapter 2, verse 13, the first half of that verse, 
find favor in your sight. And then chapter 2, verse 12, the Lord will repay your work. So it brings us to this central point. And we see that in chapter 2 and also in chapter 3 and chapter 4. And if you're interested in taking a look at this, you can let me know. And this is found throughout scripture. A lot of the Psalms actually are chiasms. And this isn't something that I came up with. I just find it fascinating. So I put this into my Bible. And also something you can look at on the top of this, there were some important points that were brought out and then also the structure of it. And so I wanted that in my Bible. And so if you'd like this, you can contact me and get a hold of it. And I just like having that added to my Bible. And so then continuing on, I've just marked wherever I see Boaz and Ruth on this page. And I'm someone that unless it's gonna be really helpful to me, I don't write notes. And I could go through and write maybe what's happening in each thing, but I'm relying on these to tell me what's happened in them. And so I'm just making notes if they're gonna help me understanding what I'm reading or important words. So up here I see the word Boaz in chapter two, verse 19. And then in chapter two, verse 20, we see the first mention of a kinsman redeemer. And here we have the man is near of kin. Now that's not kinsman redeemer. That's H7138, just near of kin, kinship of a personal relationship unto us, one of our near kinsmen, that's the word, that's H1350. So again, I have that special color coding with the red and the purple. This word kindred, I wanted to know that's the 4130, kindred or kinship, and just continuing to mark where I see those names. Now I have one sticky note here, and as I've mentioned in my other Bible, I have a lot of them. And so, so far in Ruth, I just have one question, and this is Ruth chapter three, verses one through seven, and also Ruth chapter four, verses seven and eight. I'm very curious about something, specifically verse four and verse seven it mentions about uncovering the feet. And the reason I mention that is because in Deuteronomy 25 verses 5 and 10, there's a whole part to the kinsman redeemer ceremony. And again, I haven't marked any notes, but in this, it's talking about if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger, go outside of the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. So verse 7 it says, And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate and to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. So that's just something when I was going through Deuteronomy, I noticed and it reminded me of Ruth and nobody's told me that it's connected and it may not be, but I'm really wondering if Naomi here tells her to go and lay down and uncover his feet, if that was a gentle way to say, I'm claiming you as my kinsman redeemer, what are you going to do about it? Will you lay claim to me? I think she's drawing his attention back to this whole ceremony and saying, I'm interested in you being my kinsman redeemer. And that's what Ruth does. And he says, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. I've heard that skirt over thine handmaid, that that means she's asking for his covering, his protection. And so anyways, when I read the shoe thing, it just reminded me of that, but I'm not sure. So that's why it's a sticky tab in there to wonder about. It might be something that I never get the answer to, but I didn't want to forget. So I have that marked because I think that's really fascinating that the feet are uncovered and I've always wondered why. So that's why I have that. But anyways, here again, that H1350 is in verse nine and then in verse 12, and then in verse 13. And sometimes it's a whole phrase, like here I have that green. It's that perform the part of the kinsman redeemer. And so if you're interested in doing that, you can kind of look at my Bible and get that or look at it online to find the strongs, to find where those words are. But I just want those to stand out. So here in this part, I have that symbol, the kinsman redeemer, the KR in the purple box, carry this knight 
and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of the kinsman well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth lie down until morning. So he was saying here that I am a near kinsman in verse 12, but there's one that's nearer than I. So he's going to figure this out for her, but he's saying, I'm willing to do it. So to be a kinsman and redeemer, you're not only nearest of kin or able to do it, but you also need to be willing to redeem. So people have a choice. There's one that's nearer to her as a kinsman, but is he going to be willing to perform that duty? And the fascinating thing, if you look at Revelation chapter 5, verse 7, there's this part that takes place in front of the elders, and that's going to come up again in this study. But they're looking to find someone who's able to open the scroll to redeem humanity. And Jesus, he's the one who he's willing and able, and he's our kinsman, which we're going to see. And there are two places that I wrote here. Jesus is the root of Jesse. That's Isaiah 11, verse 1 and 10. Then you can also see that in Romans. And I'm just going to give that to you. If you're curious about it, take a look at that in your Bible and see what you think about that and think of how it relates to the kinsman redeemer and come back and ask questions if you have any. So that was chapter three. And now in chapter four, it says, then Boaz up to the gate and sat down there and behold the kinsman. So that's that kinsman redeemer word of whom Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, "Ho, oh, such a one turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. So notice that this is at the gate. This is a public meeting space. It's like a town hall. It's not a general gate. It's people gather there. And he took 10 men at the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. So this again is like Revelation 5, 6. There's those elders. You're going to see that same word. So Jesus publicly redeems us in front of the elders. He claims us as his own. Here again in chapter 4, verse 3, it says, unto the kinsmen, that's that same word. And they're before the elders. That's verse four. So I've circled that. I want to notice this wording and how it's similar to Revelation. So now this is chapter four, verse five. We see Boaz and Ruth. So again, I'm continuing to notate it. And notice here it says Ruth, the Moabitess. So she's not a Hebrew. She's a Gentile like all of us. And this word kinsman in verse six and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem. And that's that same word, the 1350. I can't be the kinsman redeemer. And then this word redeem and this word redeem, those are all connected to that kinsman redeemer word. And then in verse seven, again, we see that. And here again, we have this taking off of the shoe. So that's where I had mentioned that it's in another place about this taking off the shoe and how it's connected to kinsman redeemer. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming the kinsman redeemer and concerning changing for to confirm all things. So they take off shoes to notate. So anyways, I just wonder if that's connected. So here again, we see these elders. So Boaz does it in front of the elders and unto all the people. He tells them, ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's. So he's buying the land and it's done publicly. We see that in verse 1, 2, and 10 at the city gate in front of the elders. It includes the land and it also, moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. So it also includes the woman. So this is verse 9 and 10. So remember Revelation 4 and 5, we're seeing this kinsman redeemer ceremony where Christ purchases us and the earth with his blood. And so I also want to note that he says, from the gate of this place, you are witnesses, the elders. And here we see the name Rachel and Leah. So I find it very interesting that Rachel is the person that Jacob loved, but Leah is the one who has the honor of being in the line of Jesus. And then it mentions Pharaoh's, Tamar, and Judah. They're also of the line of Jesus. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman. And that's that kinsman redeemer word, that his name may be famous in Israel. Verse 15, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. This is not the kinsman redeemer thing, but I thought that was beautiful. So it's not Buxton. So in verse 14, we're seeing it's a public celebration of the redemption. And you're going to see that celebration in Revelation 5 verses 11 through 14. And then here we have 14 and 15. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer and I have Revelation 5 verse 9. So here the book of Ruth ends with Naomi and they called his name Obed and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David, 
and these are the generations to David. I could have circled each one, but I just circled David and then that leads to Jesus. So now in the back here, I have a set of inserts and I'll just show you the back side for this part. It's connected to this. I wanted to see this visually. So I found this online and I added a few text boxes with some extra information. So we see the line of Ruth coming through the Moabites. She is a Gentile and she represents the New Testament church. And we have Boaz and he represents the Old Testament church. They're the great grandparents of King David. So it's just this information over here, just done visually. And then from them, we get Obed, Jesse, and then King David, and that leads to Jesus. He's the kinsman redeemer to Gentiles and Hebrews. So think about this. He needs to be kin with them, and he has the blood of both Gentiles and Hebrews in him, and he produces a multitude that no man can number. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So the thing that I find so amazing about this for really the first time I'm seeing this as our story, that we as Gentiles have our Hebrew mother-in-law, we've connected ourselves and become one people, and then Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. But that really touched my heart, just realizing that this is our story. So something neat that I heard that I wanted to add here is that Adam's bride came forth from his side See, we see that in Genesis. And this led to death and no hope. And Jesus' bride from his open side, which led to life, hope, and a future. So from his open side, we saw water and blood come out at the crucifixion, that cleansing, that empowering, and that forgiveness. So under the first Adam, there is death. And then Jesus is the second Adam. And then here at the beginning of chapter four, Four, I have this insert where in the green is kinsman redeemer and, and then two other words that are similar that I wanted to see and notice in these verses and it goes through the Levitical law of redeeming the people and redeeming the land and then how in Isaiah God claims us as our husband to be the redeemer Exodus 6 where he again says that word and then there are some other places like in Jeremiah verses six through nine, where he talks about redeeming the land and second Samuel chapter seven, verses 22 through 24, redeeming the people and the land. And then Jeremiah 50 verses 33 through 34, redeeming the people and the land. And then Proverbs 23, 11, their redeemer, and that's that kinsman redeemer word is mighty. He shall plead their cause with thee. So that's on this one. And then on the insert on this side, I have Christ as our kinsman redeemer. Now, the only thing about this is that I looked into some of these words where it says redeem, and it doesn't say that it's related to the Hebrew kinsman redeemer word, but it's how he became our flesh. He was able and willing to pay the price of redemption. And then the fact that Christ redeems, and that's connected to that Revelation 5 verse 9 where you see he's redeeming us in front of the elders in Revelation 14 verse four, they were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. So that's that. And this finally is kind of an overview of the study that we just went through in Ruth, how Ruth was a Gentile woman with a Hebrew mother-in-law and it linked to Isaiah 56, five, how you can join yourselves to the Lord. She says, thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God, which mirrors this concept of joining ourselves to the Lord. And Ruth 2, 1, we have Boaz, who has the ability to redeem and is also a kinsman. And then Ruth 3, 11, he talks about being willing to be the kinsman. In Ruth 4, we see how it's a public purchase and that he's gonna buy the land and the woman. And that's like Christ, he's going to redeem the earth and the woman, which represents the church. And then Ruth 4:14 4, and Revelation 5:13. there's this celebration of our redemption that happens. So there's a celebration of redemption in the book of Ruth and then also in the book of Revelation. So on here, just some additional notes that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, the white horse on Revelation. He comes conquering and to conquer. So without Christ, we are left with only the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And we need the white horse, Jesus, to make it through the other horses. And notice these horses keep riding. There isn't a time when the white horse stops riding or that the red horse stops riding. They continue riding. So that first seal, the white horse is the word of God. It's Jesus. He is what seals us. So here's just a quick look at the study pack for Ruth. 
with the maps and the genealogies, the chiasms, and some of the notes that I have on my pages. As you can see, there's not much written because a lot of it was transferred into these typed notes. And of course, genealogies, I love those. As always, these are free inserts. You just need to send an email to me and just say that you want the study pack for the Book of Ruth. So until next time, be well and God bless.